Love Talk Radio. Are you ready to take a bite out of the competition? Are you looking for ideas to make your business better? Welcome to the Core Business Show with Tim GK, sponsored by Apple Capital Group. At the core of every successful business, you'll find people making a difference. And with each episode of The Core Business Show, we talk with those people, examine those ideas, and explore the strategies that make them special. Now, the host of The Core Business Show, Tim Jacquet. Good morning and welcome to another edition of The Core Business Show. I'm Tim Jacquet, your host. Today, the series is going to continue to talk about selling to the government, business government sales. Of course, as you know, the U.S. government, federal government, is the largest buyer in the world. Buys everything from soap to widgets to missiles to airplanes. So we're going to continue our series. This the end of the second week. We have five more shows to do on the series. But today, we're going to talk about how to market, how to present, and how to promote your business to these federal agencies. We'll be back in a moment after these messages from our sponsor. You're listening to The Core Business Show, sponsored by Apple Capital Group. Apple Capital Group in Jacksonville, Florida, is a commercial lender that specializes in asset-based loans, equipment leasing and financing, invoice financing, commercial real estate loans, and asset-based financing in the U.S. and Canada. Apple Capital Group is a direct lender that lends on their private equity investment portfolio. 90% of most loans are decided within two hours and vendor funding within 24 hours after documents are completed with a one-page application. No slow no's, just a quick decision and a fast yes. To get more information about lending from Apple Capital Group, call 866-611-7457. That's 866-611-7457 to speak with one of our loan specialists. Or visit us right now at applecapitalgroup.com. Welcome back to The Core. Once again, here's Tim Jacquet. Now we talk about the actual marketing, creating the marketing strategy, and we've talked about that before. So some of these processes, we're going to go over pretty quick. So we talked about the agency method, or we talked about the geographic method. Analyzing the current market, we've talked about that in understanding the competitors on GSA and doing that in your SWOT analysis. So as you can see, a lot of the tools that you've done have brought you here. Target market to the agency or your choice. Gather intelligence on the agencies. Promote yourself to the federal customer. That'll be over the next 45 minutes. Plan your marketing because obviously the importance of planning, and this is where you're going, the RFP issue. You're looking at a proposal being issued. That's your goal is to be able to bid on that RFP. If you start planning way back when, if you've downloaded the strategic plans from the different agencies, if you developed a database so you know when a bid's going to be coming out and started marketing to the agency 12 to 18 months before the bid is redone. Because remember, you know when a solicitation comes out, you'll know how many years that's for. If it's a three-year or a five-year solicitation, if it's a base year plus four option years, five years down the road, that solicitation is going to come out again. So you'll know that. So we're creating a long-range plan. If you start planning here, where the program idea is being formed, preliminary design, it's very important. You're proactive, but as time gets closer to the RFP issue, you're getting more reactive. Like Dan says, if the first time you see a solicitation is when it is actually issued, you actually have a very small chance. That's part of the marketing development that you put forward. This is the actual process. Even though this is linear, pretend this is a big full cycle. As you Work on what you learn here in class. 
you're going to start to develop your marketing plan, your corporate goals and your objectives for your government contract. And there again, when we say government, we mean federal, state, county, city, utility, any government agency that you're going to go after. You're going to do your planning. What are your objectives? In-house R&D, you're going to brief the customer on who you are. As you brief, the customer is going to come out with what their needs are. And as you're working with a customer in these steps, you are hopefully influencing the entire process. Now, is this a diagram, Jim, that you used to use, something similar to this? Okay. <laughs> now, as we get through these steps, this is where the preliminary scope of work comes out. The government at times will put out their draft and they'll ask for input. Back in the uh, days when the GSA put pest control onto the, the GSA solicitation, they hadn't even come out with it yet. They wanted some industry input. And in one previous life, that was the industry. I was a contracts manager for a national pest control company. And I actually went to GSA. I helped them write the scope of work that we subsequently bid on and became the first company in the entire nation to have a pest control GSA schedule. But I gave them feedback here at step six and seven and helped them develop the final RFP. The more you can influence the buyer, the more you can assist them in scope because there again, these guys are very busy. And if you can help them with the scope of work, maybe there's a possibility that they will put phraseology or requirements in that scope of work that might slant that solicitation a little closer to you. Novel concept, making the scope of work more tailored towards you. If you're doing your marketing, you can also find out this information, what's coming out on the procurement forecast on every website, every federal website. So you know in the fourth quarter, something's coming out. Definitely now's the time to start working it. The more you can provide input to the contracting officer, the more opportunity you have to having that solicitation written in a way that you're, number one, familiar with it. Number two, it might even have some specifics in there for you. Anyway, so the uh, the draft RFP is issued. The final RFP is issued. You submit your proposal. The government's going to evaluate it. And Dan being on the other side for some years, tomorrow is going to talk to you about how the government evaluates. So I'm going to go through the proposal process between now and tomorrow afternoon. And then Dan is actually going to talk about how the government evaluates. So you're going to see one built and you're going to see how the government looks at it, give you insight from both sides. Proposal evaluated, the winning proposal selected, the contracts negotiated with you, hopefully, contract awarded, contract performance, contract complete. And then right here, you again establish your corporate goals. You win this contract, you now want to expand, you start looking at other solicitations. You know, you don't want to just stop with one contract. So this is a complete cycle of how the proposal process is going to go. Where are you now? You are taking a very important first step. You know, you're looking at developing a government contracting program or expanding your government contracting program. Where do you want to be? Stephen Covey says, begin with the end in mind. Decide where you want to be and create a plan to go there. Create that marketing plan. Which agencies are you going to go after? How are you going to get there? How are you going to provide the fund? How are you going to get the funding? Developing your strategic plans, your marketing plan. Definite steps. Definable, attainable, and measurable. You got to have measurable steps. You can't say in 10 years, so oh, I want to be rich. Of course, we all do. But in 10 years, I would like to have a net worth with a company of, I don't know, $8.5 million. To get there, I need to do these measurable steps along the way. What are you currently doing? You know, look at who you are based on your SWOT analysis. What are your strengths? What's the next step? Is there competitors that are going to get in your way? And what's the next step? Can there again be looking at either your strengths or your weaknesses, basing that on your opportunities out there in the marketplace? It could be that you're going specifically with how your company is going now. It could be that you need to make a change. You need to get new equipment. You need to go into another aspect of the digital copying process. Who knows? Maybe you need to get bigger machines. Maybe your machines are too big and they're tying you down. Maybe you need to go into different types of copying. Who knows? but analyzing where you are and where you want to be. As we said, the marketing can either be by agency or by geographic. Now, we talked about FOIA 
And here in a minute, you're going to see an actual copy of a FOIA letter. Freedom of Information Act, where you can get information on prior bids and copies of contracts. The agency forecast, as we talked about, you can look at that and you can start to build that into your plan because each agency is required to come out with a forecast for the next fiscal year. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. You know, if you are looking at doing a prime contract, also look at the possibility of subcontract. Look at a mix. Don't focus yourself solely on one aspect of government contracting. Get agency smart. Pretty much says it all. Spend the time going through the website, such as Homeland Security. Understand Homeland Security or one of these specific agencies under Homeland Security, Customs and Border Patrol. If you determine that's going to be a target, learn Customs and Border Patrol. Learn the people. Introduce yourself to the Ozdaboos, Bill Beckman and, and others. Find out who the field staff are. Introduce yourself. But get agency smart. Don't just go out and say, you know, send your stuff out and say, hi, this is me. Give me a call. Provide a solution. Talk about your value. With the World Wide Web, it's getting easier and easier. Sometimes there's TMI. Anybody know what TMI is? <laughs> exactly. It's tough to uh, to focus in. Too much information. Yeah. And as I talked about one of my weaknesses yesterday, I can take some of that information. I can rabbit trail off for hours. Very easy to do. So stay focused. The Ozdaboos and the Sadboos. Office of Small and Disadvantaged Business Utilization or Small and Disadvantaged Business Utilization. Officers, they say it both ways. They are great, great avenues of information. They can direct you somewhere. They can, as you call them up and talk to them. What's coming up in the agency? Oh, who do I talk to? Who is the gatekeeper? Who is the decision maker? Who is the end user? Because that's what you want to find out. You want to find the person who is going to make a decision in regards to your good or service. Small and disadvantaged business utilization. They're both pretty much synonymous. Another term you'll hear at the bottom, small business liaison officers, SBLO for the primes. That's usually what the primes call their staff. But I've also seen them called Ozdabu and Sadbu. So all three of those terms are pretty much interchangeable. Networking with them, tell them who you are, provide them with your capability statement, provide them with your marketing materials, and always, as you're interacting with them, ask them if you're not the right person, which, you know, the sad boos usually aren't, or the Ozdaboos and the sad boos usually aren't the buying authority. You can't get a contract out of them. They are simply a gatekeeper to get you somewhere else. So always ask them who is the right person for me to send my information to. And sometimes, I mean, I've had them say yes, and I'll go ahead and forward this email right to them. I mean, they'll do it for you. Others will just give you the information, but they are a good first start. As you look at the information, the FOIAs are very powerful. FedBiz Ops, you can go in and look at awards. You can click on awards and pull up information on who's gotten awards in your NACE categories, in your keywords. Government Executive Magazine is a very good source, and you can go, you can either get it online. I mean, I get a download every day of the, the key news stories in the federal agency. You can also get a hard copy solicitation. Trade associations. I know Dan mentioned MA, National Contract Management Association. I belong to Contract Services Association, CSA, which is a, a nonprofit watchdog agency in Washington, D.C. And there's about 400 contractors that belong to that group, including SAIC and Lockheed and Raytheon and a lot of the big prime contractors. So I find it's good information. They give me information. It's good networking for me. The points of contact that you're going to find out, we we were able to look at some of them on the website, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. You know, we looked at Department of Homeland Security. We looked at one page of contacts. Homeland Security, there are thousands of field agencies and offices. It's a prime contractors. One of the agencies in under DHS is FEMA. Now, we all know how big the contracts for FEMA is for disaster relief. FEMA also goes to the state aid agencies. So don't limit yourself just when you find one web page with 10 contacts on them, don't think you struck the mother load because there are so many other contacts inside the federal agencies. Drill down, drill down, and do your marketing. You can also find out their budget. You can ask for it. You can find it online. 
This is public information since you are a taxpayer and they are a federal agency. You can find their budget. You can see what their proposed spending is for certain areas. FOIA was established to allow private citizens to get information from the federal government. You can ask for contracts, modifications, pricing. There are times when a if a technical proposal that someone writes or some that you write is presented to the contracting officer and it talks about your internal business processes, those things that are proprietary, that's information that cannot be procured by FOIA, but everything else can. And what you do is you simply send a letter to the contracting officer with basically these components. In accordance with the provision of, of the Freedom of Information Act, we request, talk about what your requests are, and be specific. Please provide copies of the contract as well as all task orders issued and amendments. And I was put in there, we agree to pay necessary and reasonable research and copying costs. A FOIA can cost you between them burning copies and them actually taking the time to go research this anywhere from 5 to $50. It's about the most I've seen one cost, I think, is $56, and I got a whole bunch of paper like this. It was a couple hours and, you know, a few hundred pages on the on the Xerox. But you can ask for it. Find out the information. Do your fact-finding. Trade fairs, events, and meetings. Ask the local SBA office. Ask the FBA office when events are coming up. GSA. All you have to do is go into gsa.gov, and there is an actual events link that talks about those. Now, attend trade fairs because it's amazing how many potential clients you have right in front of you at a trade fair or an agency event. I love them because I can do so much marketing at a at a trade show or a networking event. A lot of times, the federal buyers will be sitting there across from the table waiting for you to come to a presentation. There's also one event, and write this down, www.businessmatchmaking.com www.businessmatchmaking.com. You're listening to The Core Business Show, sponsored by Apple Capital Group. That's a program jointly put together by SBA and Hewlett Packard. There are four events per year where you can actually register on the Business Matchmaking website. The prime contractors and the federal agencies register on their side of this computer. You register on one side of the computer, the primes register on the other. The computer then matches up the federal agencies who have said, I need this and this type of contractor, and you putting in your capabilities. You will then have one-on-one sit-down across the table meetings with these prime contracts. I did the one in Oakland. I had three clients there, and I had 19 face-to-face meetings with prime contractors and federal agencies. They're phenomenal. They have them at certain points around the country. Sometimes you are going to have to travel. The one earlier this year was Oakland. They're having the next one in Houston, then Philadelphia, then Miami. But next year, they'll rotate them to different places around the country. Definitely watch that website. It's very powerful. The agency forecast that you download there, again, that provides you a a marketing list. Because on the agency forecast that you download from one of the federal agencies, the names and the phone numbers and sometimes the emails are right on the uh, on the forecast. They are listed by NAICS code and they're listed by quarter. So you can actually go and search for your goods or services with the agency. As you're looking at the different projects, find out because sometimes in the federal government, the managing office of the project may be somewhere else. There may be a project in Colorado that's being managed by a an agency head in New Jersey. Definitely seen that happen. Contact your program managers. The CEO's term for contracting officer. Contact the contracting officers. They are all listed on FedBizOps, as we showed you. And see if you can get a meeting with them, with the Ozdebu. Tell you what, that's the best way, Martin. That's the best thing is to get face-to-face with the people. You know, if, if you do an email and or a phone call and or a letter and a note, the goal is to get face to face, either with the Ozdebu or with who they determine to be the end user. Pretty much do your homework. If you get a meeting with a federal buyer, do your homework. Make sure you know about the agency. Make sure you know about what you're selling. Make sure you know about your company. You know, one of the worst things to do is go into a meeting, have somebody ask you a question about your company and say, gee, I don't know. You know, three words that can kill you very quickly as far as business. 
as you practice your speech, do what I call what if training. Think, okay, what if he asked me this? Try to anticipate all the questions that buyer is going to ask you. Have somebody rehearse it with, you know, or rehearse it in front of the mirror. You know, make sure that you have your elevator speech and your USP down pat. Make sure you've done your homework. Make your briefing specific to the lowest unit. If you're going to be talking about FEMA, don't make your briefing about Mr. Chernoff, the uh, the Secretary of Homeland Security. If you're going to be talking about FEMA, talk about FEMA. If you're going to be talking about a field office in the BLM, make your briefing specific to that office. Don't try to talk agency-wide. Target, target your material. In fact, it was actually re- suggested to me by a prime contractor. He says, if you're going to market to us, look at the smallest possible denominator, the smallest, look at the smallest business unit possible to get in the front door. So be very specific to the business unit, agency, office that you're talking to. The rest will come. So make it simple. If you have a specific scope of work, if you have a specific requirement that you have identified, if you've created your database for your past contracts, you know, those are key things to point out. There are times when you can team up with an 8A because an 8A can get sole source contract. So as it says, it's virtually non-competitive. Now, 8As, there are a couple interesting categories right now to think about. Alaska Native Corporations, Alaska Alaska Natives, American Indians, and Hawaiian Natives. They can get 8A status, and they can basically get extremely large contracts. So those are things to put in the back of your mind. Alaska Native Corporations, ANCs, tribal organizations, or Native Hawaiians. Those companies are doing a lot of business right now and are always looking for good subcontracts. As there is less competition, there's also a potential to get better margins. And since there is no competition, you don't have the 268 days, there could be a quicker turnaround. So eight A's might be very advantageous to be a prime contractor partner for you. There are some disadvantages. It's all marketing. There is no competition. So you have to, your entire process of winning or losing is based on your marketing. The approach has to be very specific to the function. I had said that the ANCs can get the larger contracts. Most 8As, most other 8A contracts are capped at $3 million. Now, a segue for a minute, if you are a service-disabled veteran, your sole sources are unlimited. The three types of prime contractor responses to RFPs, unrestricted, that's where you're going to be going against everybody else. That's where anybody can apply for a solicitation. A small business set aside, that makes your chances a little bit better since only small businesses are going to be bidding on that. And if it's a small business set aside in a specific category, like a hub zone set aside, that's even better. And the final one is under an existing contract vehicle, like a GWAC or under a GSA schedule. The risk of responding to an RFP going out there now. RFP, let me back up a little bit. Request for proposal is coming up with a complete, full-blown proposal. An RFP is usually many pages. There is a long process. It's not just a fill in the bid and submit it. You do an actual technical proposal. You do, you show some past performance. At times you have to give managerial discussions. So it could be that there's long lead times. Skinny margins. You can also look at a percent and a half of your actual cost going to your bid and proposal. So it's something that you have to figure in there. As we said before, the RFPs can be up to 268 days long. I saw one of them that stretched out for two years. They just kept extending and extending the current contract as they did the did the evaluation. Then a new evaluator came in. So, yeah, RFPs can go out quite a while. As I said, percent and a half of the total contract value could be BNP money, bid and proposal. You need that up front to even develop the bid. If you have subcontractors, it might reduce your margin. Long-term marketing efforts, you have to keep it up for quite a while. Dan talked about teaming arrangements, so I'm not going, going to go into that a whole bunch because we still got one more module to go. First year sub is a good way to get into the business quickly. The prime contractors obviously are always looking for small businesses. They're looking for people to help them. They're looking for people to fill the needs that they have. When I talked to uh, Larry Trammell, who was one of the GMs and executive VPs for SAIC, he said they always have approximately 
3,500 job openings or position openings or contractual position openings at any one time. 3,500 openings nationwide that they're looking to fill either with hires or other than hires with subcontracts. SAIC. Yeah. And there's two places in the resource manual when we're talking about prime contractors. There are the one section on subcontracting. It actually gives a list of the top 10 prime contractors in the nation. Top 10 prime contractors do $90 billion in business per year, and they are always looking for subcontractors. You're listening to The Core Business Show, sponsored by Apple Capital Group. Apple Capital Group in Jacksonville, Florida, is a commercial lender that specializes in asset-based loans, equipment leasing and financing, invoice financing, commercial real estate loans, and asset-based financing in the U.S. and Canada. Apple Capital Group is a direct lender that lends on their private equity investment portfolio. 90% of most loans are decided within two hours, and vendor funding within 24 hours after documents are completed with a one-page application. No slow no's, just a quick decision and a fast yes. To get more information about lending from Apple Capital Group, call 866-611-7457. That's 866-611-7457 to speak with one of our loan specialists. Or visit us right now at applecapitalgroup.com. Disadvantage of marketing is a first-tier sub. There's a little chance to build your corporate identity because you don't deal with the federal government directly. You are always under the prime contractor. The skills can go away. They can change the contract. If they change the contract and your skills are deleted, I've seen it happen, the uh, prime contractor can just summarily dismiss you and terminate your subcontract. You are dependent on that prime contractor for, you know, for everything, direction, payment, uh, and you have no specific interaction with the government. We talked about FOIAs. That's one way to get bid information. Another way is simply to ask, if you're looking at a solicitation, ask the contracting officer what the prior information was. Sometimes you don't even need to go through that whole FOIA process. Sometimes they actually post it as part of the solicitation because they know people are going to ask. Many times, and I did this so many times, I would call a contracting officer and say, you know, could I get the prior bid information? Would you like to send it to me or do I need to send a formal FOIA in? And they know that I am going to go through the whole process. They'll say, here, I'll email it to you. And they'll say, or I had one of them, many of them actually say, we are just going to issue an amendment to the solicitation. Here's the prior information. They'll actually post it. So, but do your homework in a bid. If you're looking at something, get the prior information, find out who has it. That way you can be more intelligent when you go forward in bidding. And there might be a site visit. In section L, which is the instructions, there is usually a notice about a site visit. If there is a site visit, if there is all possible, attend it. Because going to look at a site will not only give you information about the contract, it'll let you meet the contracting officer, and it'll let you see what competition is going to be on that on that job. If you are a subcontractor, it will let you network with the primes. I mean, every time that I have the opportunity to go to a site visit, I'm there. It's a key marketing point in your bid development process. I go back to 100 people do the same thing as you. What makes you different? Always let the contracting officer know what value you bring. If it's a GSA schedule, if we're talking about that, let the contracting officer know that you can save them time. And that's a big key with contracting officers right now is saving them time. Because if they can do an order in 15 days versus putting it out there for 268, they're definitely going to go with the easier way. It just makes sense. There are less contracting officers doing more work nowadays simply because they're retiring too fast. They can't fill all the spots, so they're looking for the easy way out. Contracting officers love GSA schedules. That is a value. Explain what your value is, your unique selling proposition to them as you go forward. If you're putting a proposal together, put that in. And always, as I say, communicate that difference. Let the contracting officer know what makes you unique. If you don't get the bid, that's part of the process. Ask for a debriefing within three days of being notified you didn't win. You can ask about your strengths. You can ask about your weaknesses. Always get a debriefing. Once you learn from that, try again. If that happens, again, ask for a debriefing. Make your proposal stronger. Sharpen your pencil a little bit. Get stronger people to add into your proposal if needs be. Learn from your failures. When you win, overperform. Over deliver, you know, make sure that you have good past performance. 
And that is the precursor to you getting more business. Use those references. It's tougher and tougher to get a letter of reference from a federal agency. If your contract is large enough, you can ask for a contract evaluation. If it's over, I think, 300000 or $300,000 a year, you can ask for any eva- a formal evaluation. And what that will be is just a basic two-page form saying that you have performed under the auspices of your contract. Do your homework. Do your homework. The teaming relationships, sometimes with your competition, sometimes with the prime contractors. You know, there are a lot of businesses out there. As I was talking about the facility maintenance, there's a lot of times that two facility maintenance contractors will go together to combine their strengths to bid on the job. Work the agency forecast. Go on the websites and download those. Do your FOIAs. Ask for information. Become a smart and informed bidder. Work the agencies. Quantify what you've done recently. Look at what's going on in the in the agencies, initiatives, processes, news. Find the people. Develop your specific campaigns for those agencies. Market. Talk to the people. Find your buyers. Call the buyers. Email the buyers. Get meetings with the buyers. Stand on the buyer's doorstep if you need to. Get in front of them. Have your value proposition. Help them draft the scope to work, if at all possible. So, create a marketing strategy. Analyze your current market. There again, it's all doing your homework. The more you know, the smarter you are, the better value you can put across to the federal agencies and to the Osbadoos and to the end users. Last item for today is what's called the pre-bid process. And that's actually a precursor to what we're going to do tomorrow morning. Because tomorrow morning, we're going to actually go through an invitation for bid page by page, step by step. We'll hand you out a book that has four specific invitation for bids in it. And we will go through that page by page. To understand that, first we have to learn a thing called the uniform contract format. Most solicitations, not all, but most, have parts that are labeled A through M. A is the solicitation or contract form. That will be your standard form 1449, standard form 33, the actual contract page. B is the pricing. C is the scope of work, and so on. Each of the different sections has a specific function. I is contract clauses. J will be all the attachments. That will be where the drawings will be for machine parts, for example, would be in section J. K is that reps and search that the ORCA takes care of. L is your instructors. M is the evaluation factors. Now, in the contracts, the government actually comes across and says, we are going to tell you how we're going to evaluate the proposal. They give you hints on how you should put your proposal together. So with that, here is the magic scissors. It's called CLM. Section C talks about the scope of work. What's the government going to do? Section L gives you your instructions. Section M is your evaluation factor. You break your solicitation down. You read CLM, and then you can go to the other section. But CLM will take a big solicitation package and make it quite a bit smaller. C is an actual description of the work to be done, description of the services to be performed. That's where the government says, this is what we are going to do, where it will be done. And it will also reference technical manuals. It will direct you to to other sections. But C talks about the actual scope of work. This is what we're going to do. If it's for products, section C will talk about what they want and direct you to the drawings, the, the technical libraries. If you sell products and you look at a solicitation, Make sure you see brand name or equal if you do not sell that at specific brand name. If they're asking for a specific brand name and you sell a product, you either need to sell that brand or you do not even need to turn in a proposal because they are looking for a specific brand. Obviously, a Ford fuel pump is the only thing that's going to fit in Ford unless they say or equal and you can get some aftermarket. Section C for products will always talk about what their performance is, and what their time of delivery. You might make the best widget in the world, but if your lead time is six weeks and they want it in three weeks, then you have to comply with what their time of delivery is. Section L, one of the keys of Section L, as I talked about before, look for a site visit. Note, if there is a site visit, try to go there. They're going to ask you how the proposal volume is put together. It's going to talk about how to write your proposal. Section L is very important. M talks about the evaluation criteria. You know, what are they going to be looking for? Sometimes it'll say price. 
is more important. Sometimes it'll say past performance is more important. Read the evaluation criteria very carefully. There again, begin with the end in mind. This gives you a key on how to write a proposal because they're going to tell you what's most important. Obviously, you need to address that in your proposal. After you read the solicitation, this is where you decide if it's bid, no bid. Sometimes the best business decision for you is not to bid. You know, look at the discriminators, evaluate, as they say, the climate, some of the things to take a look at, incumbency. Is there somebody that's providing that service for 15 years? I've seen that, where one contractor has had a contract for 15 years. They get awarded every five years. They're the one that gets awarded. It does happen that somebody will get so ingrained in. Do you need to ramp up as far as, as new services, new staffing? Do you need to uh, to bring that on? Do you even have a relationship with the agency? Have you done any prior work on this program or something similar? You know, do you have a chance is what you're looking at. You know, can you support the contract? Is it within your goals? Is it something that is within your game plan that you have developed? Do you understand what they're asking for? That's a key one. Make sure you understand the technical requirements completely. Are you able to do it? Are you qualified? Do you have the licenses? You know, do you need additional resources if you only have one person and you need 35 to do this? Is it really within your scope to bring 34 other people on to add to this? All these questions get to the point, is it a smart business decision for you to bid? You're working right now on the bid, no bid. Is it new? Is it a recompete? Is there anything that you can get information-wise about the budget? It might be interesting to know that the budget is zero and they're trying to compete something. If the budget is zero and it's what's called an IDIQ, indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity, and they have no budget for it, are you going to get something? I had that happen with a uh, with a prior company. They uh, they went into a new contract. It was estimated at $250,000 a year. They ramped up for $250,000 a year. It was IDIQ the first year. They got $17,000. And they had ramped up for $250,000. Understand the solicitation and do your intel. Who are the other bidders? Do they have contacts with the agency? Do they have a good reputation? Know your competition. That's basic business marketing. Doing your FOIAs. By FOIA, you'll understand who has the contract. Asking the contracting, sometimes you can ask the contracting officer a whole lot of questions. Sometimes they'll answer, sometimes they won't. You know, if you know your industry, if you've tracked it and you know your competition, you know what they're doing. You know, just good competitive intel. Remember I talked about helping write the scope of work? Maybe somebody else got in there first. But if you can help write the scope of work, is it tailored to you? You know, that's something that, you know, you see, I'm not going to say all the time, but you do see it from time to time out there that a bid will be tailored. Can you bring people on board after you get the award or do you have to have them in place at the time of the bid proposal? That's a key point. Sometimes you have to identify the staff that will be on that contract in your proposal. A lot of times it's key personnel, you know, your management staff, your a lot of the bigger ones that you'll see have a quality assurance evaluator, project manager, an assistant project manager, key persons in the organization. So they'll ask for them or they can ask for just a description of the person that's going to be in there. So it gets you all to the bid, no bid decision. Look at each one of the issues. Do you have a chance to win? If you have a chance, put your efforts into it. Take it on 110%. Go after it you now and put together the best proposal based on your value proposition, based on the marketing materials and the marketing text and the copy that you've created. Put a very good proposal together. I'll show you an example. Actually, if you want tonight, if you've got your laptops with you, taking your CDs with you, pull up that RFP. Pull up the sample RFP that's on your CD. You can take a look at one. We are going to look at it tomorrow, though. When we talk about evaluating the climate, is bidding even an option? A lot of times you'll require so many clarifications from the government. Now, the government is supposed to get answers to the questions before proposals are due. There are times when some companies will bombard them with so many questions that there's no way that they can get all the questions answered. But if you have a question on a solicitation, get it in as soon as possible for clarification. Because you don't want to bid on something that's vague and then be under contract to provide that and have all sorts of, you know, clarifications down the road. Get the clarifications up front. 
be prudent on what you decide to bid on. Because sometimes the best decision is what's not to bid. And if it's something you think you have a chance, a good chance of winning, put all the efforts you have into it and put together a quality proposal. There's so many companies I've seen, they throw something together at the last minute. They throw it, they throw it in UPS, they throw it in FedEx, and it's not a quality product. Why did they even spend the time and the effort? Put your effort into get it, putting a quality product together and showing value. Okay. We briefly went over the uniform contract format, read and analyze the solicitation using CLM, and set your bid parameters, decide whether you're going to bid, no bid. Do your intelligence, look at your market, understand the competition as much as you can. The more intelligent you are about the market, the better chance you have of winning. Thank you for listening to The Core Business Show with Tim Jacquet. For a free quote on equipment leasing and financing, visit our website, applecapitalgroup.com. That's applecapitalgroup.com. And fill out the information to receive your free quote. We hope you'll join us for our next episode. And remember, you can always get to The Core via iTunes. You'll find all our previous episodes there. Thanks again for listening to The Core Business Show with Tim Jacquet.